to start with a respiratory tract. And there are some important aspects that I want you to keep in mind. It will help you to understand, especially when we talk of some of the important microorganisms that cause problem in respiratory tract. Now, if you remember, we've been talking about anatomy and physio physiology of the respiratory tract. And once you inhale a microorganism, of course, there's a whole tract there beginning from nose and throat. Then we have upper and lower respiratory tract. Then we have lung and conducting systems. And then finally, we have respiratory membranes also called, called gas exchange area. So if you pay attention that uh, many a times, depending upon the size of that particular microbe, will determine where the attachment of those microbes can be and where they would finally lodge. Now, if you pay attention uh, to the whole respiratory tract, there is a conduction pathway that goes all the way till respiratory bronchioles. And after respiratory bronchioles, where you have the muscle layer, we have respiratory membrane. So the disposition of those particular microbes depend upon their size. That's the important thing that I want you to understand. If the microorganisms are more than 10 micrometer, they are going to lodge in nose and throat. So upper respiratory tract infection very common, especially in throat, because uh, that takes the major brunt of whatever we take in. And then any particle from 5 to 10 micrometer will lodge itself into upper and lower respiratory tract. And then again is a conduction pathway. And then finally, a microorganism has to have a size less than 2 micrometer uh, to lodge itself and cause pneumonia, especially uh, for those particles that cause pneumonia. And if you remember, the size of a red blood cell is 5 micrometer. The size of a white blood cell is somewhere from 12 to 15 micrometer and the size of monocyte macrophages about like two micrometers. So we're looking at a bigger size. Now also remember that uh, especially upper respiratory tract, there is a cilia there. So that's a propulsive movement that's gonna push mucus outwards. And uh, those people who are chronic smokers or alcoholics, they kind of lose that power to push out. So they, they are the one, their ciliary action will be muted. Now classically, we, when we talk of gram-negative rods of respiratory system, these are the three major uh, bacteria that we usually uh, think of, Haemophilus, Legionella, and Bardetella. So let's take Haemophilus as the first one, as it suggests Haemophilus influenzae, suggesting to you that it's something to do with uh, influenza, but it's nothing to do with flu. So it's nothing to do with flu. Flu is like a layman term that we say, people sometimes refer to common cold as flu. I've got flu, I've got stomach flu. These are layman terms and not the scientific terms. And again, uh, you can see respiratory mucous membrane and these bacteria are sitting on top of that. Now, if you look at their uh, biology, they tend to be very small. Remember I told you small because they are gram negative and they need to go and lodge themselves into the respiratory area. And they are gram negative. They can be pleomorphic, suggesting they could be cocci or bacilli. They are facultative anaerobes. They can ferment. The most important thing for their uh, pathogenesis is that they have X and V factor. And we will discuss that in a while. We divide Haemophilus influenza into uh, different types from A to all the way F. And then again, biochemical, we can also classify them from one to eight. The other important thing for many different types of H influenza is especially H influenza B. It's, it's, it's called HIB. It's not HIV, which is human immunodeficiency virus, HIB suggests uh, that's the most virulent. And why is this virulent? Because it carries a 
polyribertol phosphate in the capsule, which is called PRP. And that basically allows this particular bacteria to cling on to the structures, whether they have a pili suggesting, of course, because they have a hair-like projects or they, may can, they can also attach themselves to non pilus structures. Now, as I said earlier, uh, Haemophilus B is the most important thing. And that's why there was a time we used to have a lot of problems, especially in pediatric patients. But ever since we got uh, this vaccine available, HIEB, so that's a uh, Haemophilus influenzae type B vaccine, which is, again, very really important uh, as a part of childhood vaccination. Doesn't mean that there are not many other Haemophilus species. I'm going to talk about at least uh, three species in this genus which are important, especially for differential diagnosis. Number one is Haemophilus aegyptius. That again is a very common cause of acute and purulent conjunctivitis. So that's there we have pus formation in the eye. Haemophilus ducrii is basically uh, a differential diagnosis when we will discuss syphilis. I'm going to talk about a ulcer on the genitals it's called chancre or canker or chancroid, something to look like a chancre. And then again, Haemophilus duclei will come. And then finally, Haemophilus, Haemophilus influenzae, para influenzae. So that's like a different uh, isolate, what, whatever, but it's not pathogenic. And many a time, if a bacteria is non-pathogenic, and if a person has that uh, as an opportunistic infection, that's very common for AIDS patients and people who have immunodeficiencies. Now, if you look at the clinical picture, you can see from here on the left-hand side, uh, H. influenzae, typically meningitis. So that's where it used to hit uh, children because they used to have meningitis before, before we have HIV. Uh, otitis, non typable sinusitis, epiglottitis. So you can see all these terms ending with itis, mean inflammation. So you have all the way upper respiratory tract and lower uh, respiratory tract all the way till your respiratory membrane where you have pneumonia. And non typable basically means that, remember I just told you from A to F, sometimes we are unable to type them because because of many different reasons that we may not be able to find those antibodies. Haemophilus aegyptius, again conjunctivitis, and it can also cause, uh, we call fever. So that's another type of a, a fever, a perpetual fever that normally get. And as I just told you, and I'll discuss that again, Haemophilus ducrii, which is a painful ulcer on the genitals and lymph nodes, is called chancroid or chancre or canker. These are two normally terms that we will discuss when we talk of STIs and STDs. We need to grow that on the media and because to, touch, uh, to test for uh, culture sensitivity. So we have to provide them with some growth stimulating hormones. And as I said earlier, X factor and uh, V factor. X stands for hemin. There's still a lot of debate going, going on as to what that factor is. But we do know that V stands for vitamin, and it is a nicotinamide adenine, adenine nucle dinucleotide, NAD. So imagine if this bacteria was to grow in your system, it's going to chew up all of these supplements that you may have in your body. So we basically grow this particular uh, bacteria on a heated blood agar. So those of you who came to the lab or come to the lab, we give you a nutrient agar. It's like a china grass, like a gelatin. But this basically is where you uh, heat the blood, become chocolate, and that's where we have to grow Haemophilus. A typical gram stain you can see on the top. And then again, you can also see uh, a scenario, especially in Africa, where there is no such thing called uh, childhood vaccination. And you can see uh, tons of this particular bacteria growing in, uh, in especially in CSF of those uh, babies and those children causing overwhelming meningitis. Uh, I just told you this, it has a polysaccharide capsule and it has got a lot of different antigens over there. 
And the most important thing that we are interested in basically is a, a lipopolysaccharide which has uh, endotoxin activity. So again, gram-negative respiratory rods, gram-negative per se are important. And most of the story that you will hear for the problems that we have for this bacteria is before the introduction of HIV vaccine. So you can imagine that it was it had a very high mortality. So once we have a vaccine introduced, especially in this type, in part of the world, we pretty much have taken care for all uh, the problems. The only problem we do have is now, because vaccine is based upon the capsule, so we may have some problem with non-capsulated or non-typable uh, strain, because if you cannot have a capsule, you won't have any kind of a antigen uh, expressed on the surface, so we may have a problem. So the most important th thing is PRV, as I just told you, uh, is there that will give an added advantage to this bacteria to attach. So if you pay attention over here, ribosyl ribitol phosphate, and it has the, that kind of a hairy-like projections, and uh, it will attach to those uh, respiratory cells, and then, of course, attachment, invasion, and infection will begin. What are the typical infection caused by Haemophilus influenzae? Again, you will see that uh, you would not see in this part of the world, but you'll see in Asia and Africa where people don't get vaccination. And you will see, again, on the top, meningitis, conjunctivitis, sinusitis, and then again, some of the skin infection like cellulitis. And uh, if you know your anatomy of upper respiratory tract, so you will see the mucosa from nasal mucosa, oral mucosa, sinus mucosa, all the way through station tube connects with the middle ear. And middle ear, if you remember, uh, has a very thin roof. And that's the ethmoid, the base of ethmoid sinus. And if pus accumulates and pushes itself, it's going to go either rupture the eardrum or it's going to go up and cause meningitis. So that's what used to happen in this particular uh, patient before the advent of vaccine. Uh, how does it cause disease? Again, uh, it colonizes the upper respiratory tract. So the moment uh, after birth, babies will pick it up. And then there's always a danger that they can, uh, if they're not properly vaccinated, they may cause acute disease. And those of you who have seen especially uh, neonatal patients and uh, toddlers, you will appreciate that otitis media is one of the common things that you see. And if you remember, I also discussed with, with you something called meringotomy. Does anybody remember what is meringotomy? No? Remember I said that uh, the rule of surgery is that uh, Wherever there is a pus, we have to drain it. And if you leave the pus to itself, it's going to go and burst open and rupture. So if you rupture something, you will have very bad scar and you have a lot of fibrosis. So we would rather give you a scar, a cut it up, so you have a healing by primary intention. So what they normally do is, if uh, especially uh, babies get repeated otitis media, ear infection, so we put a small tube in their uh, eardrum so the drainage can take place so there's no such thing uh, as a rupture causing ugly scarring there so that's what is called meringotomy and again as I said earlier dissemin disseminated disease can only occur uh, if the children are unvaccinated so that's a major thing that many of the states have made sure that they mandate by law that the children have to be vaccinated Okay, then again, uh, as far as pathogenesis is concerned, I, I, I'm pretty sure by now you must have realized that when we talk of pathogenesis, the very first thing we need to talk of is attachment of bacteria to those uh, particular cells. There's a property called tropism. So cells have this affinity, a liking to be attached to particular cells because of X, Y, Z reasons. In this case, this is these polysaccharide that is a hair-like project projection. It clings on to the cilia expressed on the respiratory membrane. And then again, uh, 
if there is no uh, antibodies, remember for any encapsulated bacteria, you have to have opsonins, like antibodies. If you have deficiency, for example, if you have splenectomy, and if you have some other problems in terms of uh, humoral immunity, immunodeficiencies, you may have problem with taking care of uh, this particular bacteria and then it can spread to meninges and it can spread uh, as, as a blood-borne infection, a bacteremia, and wherever the blood takes, it will go over there. In an unvaccinated individual, a child, a meningitis remains number one clinical uh, presentation. Epiglottitis basically is inflammation of epiglottis. And if you remember your uh, gastrointestinal tract, when the food bolus goes down the lower part of the uh, larynx, uh, pharynx, and then close to pharynx, and then epiglottis basically covers up, pushes up on top of the uh, air pipe so the bolus of food can pass. So in this case, if that's swollen, uh, we'll have problems there. And again, uh, pneumonia, especially if you are old and you are a chronic smoker, you are alcoholic, things of that nature, where your cilia is disturbed. If you look at the epidemiology, you will see that uh, most of the time, as far as uh, H. influenza B is concerned, it's pretty much eliminated because of the vaccine. The only other things that we may see uh, in United States and some of the Western world is uh, STD, where uh, people will get this particular hemophilus by some of the sexual pattern that they may have, and then they will pick it up from patients' oropharyngeal flora, and then again we present as a genital ulcer. As I just said earlier, uh, when we have problems of complement, if you don't have a complement or you have just gone splenectomy, you want to make sure that we do give you uh, a passive immunity for protection against this bacteria, especially for the capsulated bacteria. Uh, these are the number of reported cases for invasive HIV in person aged five years and less. And this is from one of the states. It varies from state to state. I just picked up one. And you can see 1992, it was way high as compared to uh, 2008 and later. But you will see a pattern that keeps on coming. And then again, uh, why is it that it keeps on coming? Also remember that some of the states may not mandate vaccination and CDC does recommend and uh, make sure that all the children are properly vaccinated. How do we diagnose? Again, uh, microscopy is a sensitive test we can use do culture on chocolate agar. What is chocolate agar? Is heated blood. And then again, we want to do antigen specific tests, especially if we fear that this is coming from HIV. Broad spectrum antibiotics usually are given. And then active immunization again for PRP vaccine is the most important recommendation that we normally uh, do. And as, as I said earlier, uh, very rarely it's seen, so you have to travel to Asia or Africa to see the advanced cases. Okay, let me jump to the next.